Uh, let me uh, begin by uh, thanking everyone, uh, the audience that has been here to participate in this uh, uh, webinar on uh, China-Iran deal that has recently happened. Uh, we have to look into the several aspects, whether it is real or it is just a mirage. So that is the aspect that we are here to look at. And uh, I begin by, thank, uh, by thanking our Middle East Institute Singapore for organizing this event. And uh, now my colleague Clemens, who has put the panel together. And I also welcome all the panelists here, all the four panel, panelists that, that are present here from uh, different parts of the world. And uh, uh, this is actually a very interesting theme and quite timely to discuss uh, because a lot of interest has been generated in the media, in the academic circle, and also in the diplomatic circle as to what exactly is the nature and depth of this particular Iran-China deal and uh, what would be the implication of it, uh, of course, depending upon the nature and depth of this particular deal. Is it uh, really what it appears or is there something else uh, that we are not able to see? So in order to answer many of such questions and uh, doubts that might be there in our mind, uh, we are here with a, a very qualified uh, set of panelists who would be shedding some light on some of our questions related to this particular issue. So let me, uh, let me uh, thank all the panelists and uh, introduce them one by one. And uh, I will begin in the manner that they will be speaking. Uh, our first speaker would be Dr. Jeremy Garlick. Uh, he is an associate professor at the Prague University of Economics and Business and director of the Jan Masaris Center of International Studies within the same university. He specializes in China's international relations, focusing primarily on the progress and regional implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative. He is the author of the book, the impact of China's Belt and Road Initiative from Asia to Europe. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Jeremy. Thank you so much for coming here. Our second panelist would be Dr. Zakia Yazdan Shinas. Yeah, she is a research fellow at the Center for Middle East Study, Strategic Studies in Tehran. She holds a PhD in regional studies from the University of Tehran, and her expertise lies in great power rivalries in the Middle East. She is also a freelance journalist with contributions to Iranian media, Al Monitor, and foreign policy. Quite qualified to look at the Iranian angle. Welcome, Dr. Zakia. And now our third panelist is Dr. Jin Liang Jiang, who is a senior research fellow at the Center for West Asian and African Studies and Institute for Strategic International Strategic Studies, Shanghai Institute for International Studies. He is specialized in the Middle Eastern international relations and is particularly engaged in the field of Iran's foreign policy and domestic politics. I just see him. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jane. Uh, yeah, just to continue with your profile, I was telling that you have also been a visiting fellow at the Truman Institute for the Advancement of Peace, Frederick yes. Albert Stiftung, New York office, the Baker Institute, and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jane. Our fourth panelist here would be Ms. Fatima Aman. She is a non-resident senior fellow at the Middle East Institute, Washington, DC. She has written on Iran, Afghan, and broader Middle Eastern affairs for over 20 years. She has also worked and published as a journalist. She was previously an Atlantic Council non-resident senior fellow. Her writings have appeared in numerous publications, including Jane's Islamic Affairs, Analyst, Jane's Intelligence Review, and publications of Atlantic Council and the Middle East Institute. Fatima has also advised the US government and non-governmental organizations on Iranian regional policy. We are especially thankful to her because I assume that it is five o'clock in the morning there in Washington DC, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Fatima. And uh, as uh, we shall proceed uh, with our first uh, panelists, let me just uh, inform uh, our esteemed audience on the format of questions so that will follow after the full presentation. Uh, as uh, you, you must be familiar that there are two options. Either you can raise your hand and uh, our event team will allow you to unmute and open your camera so that you can ask your question. Alternatively, you can also type your question so that I can read it on your behalf. So with that, uh, let me let me uh, welcome our first panelist, uh, Dr. Jeremy, who would be uh, uh, shedding 
uh, this deep strategic conceptual uh, light on the whole issue and uh, we would expect him uh, to specifically discuss some of China's regionalism, regionalizing international relations and economic diplomacy, uh, such as strategy hedging uh, with respect to, uh, respect to US and Saudi Arabia. Uh, he may also stretch a little and give us some comparative case studies pertaining to India. So, uh, uh, Dr. Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for the uh, very nice introduction and thank you also to the Middle East Institute for, for inviting me today. I'm very happy to, to be here much among such uh, uh, estimable, estimable uh, company, right? So um, I'm going to get on with it. I'm going to explain at the beginning that this is based, uh, this presentation is based on two uh, peer reviewed papers I've published with uh, Radka Havlova, who's my co-author, who she, she is a, an expert in the Middle East uh, I'm more of an expert on China's international relations, as you said, and Belt and Road Initiative. So this uh, presentation is mostly based on our first paper in the Journal of Current Chinese Affairs. So if you want more, I, I would suggest go and check out those papers. OK, so I'm going to uh, start from the point of view that uh, you, you, as the title of this, uh, this discussion is, is a, is a China-Iran deal reality or a mirage? And I'm going to be arguing that it's more of a mirage. Right. So um, I'd start out with the observation that what puzzled me when I was looking at this China Iran deals uh, was that, you know, I first looked at the deal. The first deal I saw was mentioned in September 2019. And then there was another mention of a deal in July 2020. And each time uh, there was a mention of a figure of four hundred billion dollars. So I became very interested in this because I thought, well, Iran is strategically important for China. Um, it, it must be must be going through, and then I looked and I looked more at the data, and I have to uh, point out that this, what I, my analysis is going to be data based, is not values based. I'm not making any judgments about anything. I'm just tr trying to look through the data. I found, as as Jacopo Schitta has pointed out, that um, in 2016 there was a comprehensive strategic partnership signed between China and Iran, and the odd thing is that we have seen since that time, we have seen announcements of huge amounts of investment coming from China into Iran several times. So as I say, 2016, we saw September 2019, July 2020, and now we see the latest mention of, of a deal with a lot of Chinese investment coming in. Um, but when you look at the data, as I'm going to show you some data, we see that the amounts of investment coming from China there is investment coming from China into Iran, but the amounts generally since 2016 have been smaller than, than they were supposed to be. So I'm analyzing here, why is uh, China's investment, China obviously is investing in Iran, but why are the amounts not as much as we might expect? So this is my starting point. And what I'm positing is that this is uh, a strategic hedging on the part of China. So the theoretical framework I'm using here is strategic hedging. I'm going to look at all these parts during the presentation, China's aims in the Persian Gulf, the Belt and Road Initiative, and I'm drawing, uh, drawing in the Iran-Saudi Arabia rivalry, you know, the geopolitics of the Persian Gulf, and drawing in that. I'm going to look at Iran, Saudi Arabia, and then finish off at the end. So I'll try to go through fairly quickly, right? So I'm, I'm saying here that because of the regional rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran, right, China needs both, both partners, right? It needs both partners. They're both very important. Saudi Arabia is a very important oil supplier. China also needs oil from Iran. There are various other factors involved that make both of them very important partners also in terms of trade. So China, they, they are entrenched rivals in the region. They are fighting various proxy wars. They are very, there's a lot of rivalry between the two of them. China has to somehow hedge between the two of them. It needs both of them. So for this reason, it cannot commit to Iran as much as it would perhaps like to, or as much as the official statements are broadcasting, right? There's not as much commitment as is, is on paper. So I'm defining here strategic hedging as the mitigation of risk via the diversification of strategic investments and interests. So China is trying to diversify, spread its risk. It can't afford to put all its eggs in one basket and it can't afford 
to just commit to Iran alone, right? And this is linked to China's use of economic diplomacy, diversifying risk in the interests of China's comprehensive national security, which includes oil supplies, right? The oil supplies from the, mid, from the Persian Gulf are crucial for China's economic, maintaining China's economic growth. So this, to summarize the main point of this, China is trying to boost relations with both Saudi Arabia and Iran at the same time without alienating either of them. And it also has to think about the US involvement. The US also tends to criticize Iran and has tended to alienate Iran. And this has also affected China's ability to invest in Iran in the quantity that it might, might be on paper. Okay. So in the literature, strategic hedging is taken as a form of soft balancing by smaller states against larger ones. But I am saying that that's too specific and I don't see why uh, we cannot analyze China's activity also through strategic hedging. So I'm saying that China is hedging its bets uh, by investing in as many countries as possible, by establishing relations with as many countries as possible. And in the Persian Gulf, Iran and Saudi Arabia, the two largest powers, they are both significant exporters of oil to China. China needs both of them. China does not want to alienate either of them, and it doesn't want to become bogged down in Middle Eastern politics, right? So it pursues, in my argument, a strategic hedging approach. Okay, here we can see China's oil imports. This is from 2014, but I think it's still pretty illustrative of today's figures. And you can see that Saudi Arabia is China's biggest supplier of oil. China cannot afford to alienate Saudi Arabia, Iran's rival, because it needs Saudi oil. You can see also that Iran is in fourth place on that list, very close to second place. Um, it, the figures go up and down. So China needs both of these two countries uh, to cooperate with. So China needs, what are China's goals in the Persian Gulf? It needs uh, continued energy supplies. It wants to establish goodwill with all partner countries through the BRI. Saudi Arabia is also a BRI partner, Belt and Road Initiative partner. It wants to establish good relations with Saudi Arabia also. And China needs to keep the Chinese economy stimulated by exporting domestic industrial overcapacity. That means that China wants to find commercial opportunities for its companies. It needs to, uh, especially construction companies, it needs to be uh, pushing the companies out in the world to build infrastructure. This is good for the Chinese economy. Okay, aims of China's Belt and Road Initiative. China is uh, trying to increase the country's geoeconomic and, and geopolitical influence. I mean, geoeconomic influence, but also I would argue geopolitical influence. It's trying to serve in the service of what in Chinese is called comprehensive national power, which can be defined as the sum of a country's political, economic, and ideational strength. So it is about economics, but there's also political questions. You cannot separate economic and political questions uh, from each other. And the, the second point here is China's national security is very important, which is here, I def uh, Heath defines it as the intermingling of economic and security issues. So, so it's not just about security. China's economy is part of its security. It has to keep the economy growing. It needs the energy supplies. It needs to build up markets, right? So why is the Middle East important for Belt and Road Initiative? It's a strategic location between Europe, Africa, and Asia. And also it has significant resources of oil and natural gas. So it's a very important crossroads point, but also a very important supplier of energy to China. It's very important in the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, the problems for China there are the, the regional instability, the civil wars that we see there, Sunni Shia tensions, which is one of the major tensions between Saudi and Saudi Arabia and Iran, are the Sunni Shia tensions, which create a lot of uh, political uh, issues for China to navigate in the region. So that the geopolitics of the region are dominated by this Saudi Arabia Iran rivalry, and the U.S. is also involved, right? As we've seen in the last few years, 
uh, with Donald Trump withdrawing from the, the Iran nuclear deal, this has also impacted China's ability to do what it would it might want in the region. Okay, I'm not going to go over this uh, in, in, in uh, all the details of this, uh, but we see that with Iran and Saudi Arabia, they were uh, cooperating until 1979, and we see 1979 was the turning point where they, Iran had the Islamic Revolution, and uh, from that point on, we see uh, poorer, you know, more tense relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which has sometimes been called an Islamic Cold War or a new Middle Eastern Cold War. Uh, we see a lot of proxy wars. We see struggles for regional dominance in the Persian Gulf. So this is what, uh, without going into any more detail, this is what China has to navigate. So Iran, Iran, if you look at Iran, Iran looks like a very important location located on the Persian Gulf it would be possible to connect by, and the uh, Chinese have already done this, connect by rail, connect overland from China through Central Asia down into Iran. Looks like an obvious partner for China and for the Belt and Road Initiative. So this comprehensive strategic partnership was established in 2016, and we see massively increased trade volumes since from 2001 to 2018. You can see massively increased trade volumes, and we see a lot of Chinese investments in Iran, in the oil and gas industry, and in infrastructure such as railroads. Um, so just to give you some, some idea of the, how the trade has gone up between China and Iran, we see this, this huge spike in trade after the year 2000. So over the last 20 years, huge spike. And we also see here that China is a very, very important customer for Iran's oil. In fact, it's, it's Iran's number one customer. So China is very important for Iran. Um, Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, um, we also see, uh, uh, I think what I want to say in the second point is that there's also a comprehensive strategic partnership between uh, Saudi Arabia and, and China. There are some similarities between the Belt and Road Initiative and the Saudi Vision 2030. And we also see massively increased trade volumes between uh, China and Saudi Arabia. China is also investing in Saudi Arabia's oil and gas industry and infrastructure. So it's also investing there. We see the same kind of pattern as in Iran. Um, Saudi Arabia's exports by country. Again, we see that China is Saudi Arabia's number one partner, number one export partner. And China is also uh, Saudi Arabia's number one import partner. So it's a very, China's a very, very important partner for Saudi Arabia, and Saudi is an important partner for China. Um, I just want to show here China's exports, the top left, you can see that there are very similar levels of exports to Iran and to Saudi Arabia, very similar levels. It really needs both of them, right? On the top right, you can see there has been more uh, investment in Iran than Saudi Arabia. So that, on, from that point of view, it looks like Iran is the more important partner. There's been more investment in Iran than Saudi Arabia. But if we look at the, the, the table at the bottom, or the graph at the bottom, we see that Saudi Arabia is a bigger trade partner than Iran, right? So Saudi Arabia is very important for China, uh, perhaps in trade levels more important than Iran. So my conclusions, I'll wind this up. There are specific regional characteristics to China's approach to the Persian Gulf. They are rooted in the Chinese approach to economic diplomacy, and they're rooted in uh, the strategic hedging approach. Um, Chinese commercial act actors, which, which are state-owned enterprises, private companies, are used in the service of national strategic objectives. And from the Chinese perspective, uh, to promote the goals of the Belt and Road Initiative demands a careful management. They have to be careful, don't want to become entangled in the region's geopolitical problems, but at the same time, they need to maintain relatively good or as good as possible relations with both Iran and Saudi Arabia and hopefully with the US as well. And I just want to finish with a, a, another statistic, uh, which I put in my second article, uh, where the dispatched labor statistics from China to, to various countries. Uh, 2018, there were just over 3,000 uh, Chinese workers in Iran, but in Saudi Arabia, there were over 18,000. 
right? So the, the amount of labor dispatched to Saudi Arabia is much larger than Iran. The Saudi figure is coming down a bit. The Iranian figure is going up, but we still so far see a very much more larger commitment to Saudi Arabia than to Iran. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing. Thank you for your attention and thank you for this opportunity uh, to present my research. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeremy. It was quite insightful and you have actually laid the groundwork with very crystal clear ideas. And uh, one most important thing that has actually emerged is that uh, there is equal importance of both Saudi Arabia and Iran. And of course you have waited Saudi Arabia a little more than Iran. So the question arises here is that why has Iran been talking so much about this deal? while well, Saudi Arabia has not been to that level. And I think that is the primary question. Also other related aspects such as what is this deal's position in the entire foreign policy paradigm of Iran, especially it's uh, as people are expecting having leverage over a US uh, in the process of the nuclear deal. And if actually there is a deal as we are looking at it, then what exactly are the avenues where the investments could be made apart from hydrocarbon sectors? So with these questions, I turn uh, to Dr. Zakia, and I think uh, you may speak for about 10 minutes so that we can have more time for question and answer. Thank you so much. The floor is yours, Dr. Zakia. Um, uh, greetings all. Uh, Thank you, Osef. Uh, thank you for your very kind words uh, and introduction. And uh, thank you and your colleagues for arranging this uh, wonderful event uh, and inviting me uh, and giving me this opportunity to share my ideas with you uh, and the audience and the other panelists as well. Uh, it's uh, really a great pleasure for me to be here uh, today. Uh, the main focus of my discussion is uh, on the examining the different uh, Iranian perspectives on the comprehensive strategic partnership between Iran and China uh, and the foreign policy strategies each perspective uh, proposes. So uh, I'm not going to deal with the position of uh, Iran in the Belt and Road uh, Initiative as uh, Dr. Uh, Garlic uh, covered this issue very well. Uh, historically, uh, the Sino-Iranian relationship uh, dates back to the early uh, 1970s. Uh, Iran has the uh, longest history of uh, bilateral relations with uh, China in the region, in the Middle East. Uh, but uh, their bilateral relations have always been defined in a, a triangle, which the United States is its uh, third party. And at different times, uh, the patterns of friendship and enmity uh, between uh, these three sides of uh, this triangle uh, have been different. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it is impossible uh, to assess uh, Iranian perspectives on the deal uh, without considering Iran's relationship with the United States. Uh, concerning uh, the new strategic partnership, uh, first, uh, I should mention that uh, we should differentiate between Iranian public opinion and the academics and political elites views. Uh, generally speaking, uh, Iranian public opinion is skeptical of the agreement. One reason is that uh, Iranians do not have a clear understanding of uh, Chinese foreign policy behavior. Um, and the other reason is uh, the decline of uh, public trust uh, in the government, in the Iranian government, uh, due to its increasing inefficiency in recent years. Um, regarding the political elites, I can say uh, they all agree on the necessity of uh, framing a new kind of relationship with China uh, in the contemporary era. They um, have actually uh, reached uh, to a consensus. Uh, as a sign, Iran's supreme leader, uh, Ali Khamenei, has appointed Ali Larijani as Iran's special envoy for uh, strategic ties uh, with China. Uh, with the aim of signaling to the Chinese that Tehran uh, wants 
uh, a strategic relationship with China, regardless of the uh, incumbent uh, administration's uh, political uh, leanings. Uh, however, mm, I think uh, there is no consensus on its underlying cause and logic among the uh, political elites, of course. So uh, the ruling elites viewpoints uh, on the agreement can be summarized in uh, three different categories. Uh, the first group uh, known as the principalists in Iran, uh, which includes the conservatives and neoconservatives, uh, they do not trust the West and especially they do not trust the United States, uh, referring to the uh, experience of the JCPOA, uh, the continued sanctions against Iran, the inaction of European countries, uh, and uh, several US attempts uh, to change the Iranian uh, political system in different times. Uh, they assess uh, the developing dynamics of the international system as a declining US uh, relative power uh, versus increasing China's relative power. And they believe that these changes should be seen as opportunities to authoritarianize uh, with the rising power, which in this case is China, uh, and to maximize uh, Iran's uh, national interests. They highlight uh, the importance of uh, the common denominator of China and Iran, uh, which is their current uh, strained relations with the United States. Um, I think uh, this view can be uh, best theorized as implementing uh, the strategy of balancing, balancing strategy. Uh, although um, the essence of this strategy is defensive and it is aimed to guarantee Iran's uh, territorial security and the survival of its political regime, uh, it hopes for boosting Iran's regional uh, role uh, in the second phase, in the next level. Uh, Iranian balancing strategy uh, has been uh, hitherto uh, designed against the United States, uh, United States allies in the region, in the Middle East. Uh, Iran's uh, military might and its network of um, semi-alliances known as the Axis of Resistance, as uh, Iranian uh, as Iranians call it, uh, call it uh, constitute uh, its internal and external balancing. Proponents of uh, the aforementioned view believe that as the China-US competition intensifies, uh, China will no longer be able uh, to avoid involving in the Middle East security issues. They are hoping for using this involvement as a kind of external balancing against the United States uh, in the region, and particularly in the Persian Gulf. Uh, this group uh, mainly dominates the security institutions nowadays, uh, nowadays. And it is predicted that the next administration will be formed by the same group. The second group emphasizes on having uh, equal and cooperative relations with all major powers, including the United States, Russia, and of course, China. Uh, they adapt uh, a kind of uh, hedging strategy. And by hedging strategy, uh, I mean a strategy of uh, active multilateral engagement uh, rather than uh, balancing. Uh, quite similar uh, to the uh, concept which uh, Dr. Garlic explained uh, very well. Uh, they insist that uh, Iran should avoid putting uh, its eggs in one basket and avoid giving priority to the East over the West or vice versa. And uh, we can clearly distinguish the prevalence of this mindset among the officials of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, generally the officials of the Rouhani administration. Mohammad Javad Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, and Ali Akbar Salehi, the head of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, have clearly defended this attitude uh, in their speeches recently. Um, and finally, uh, there is a, a third group. Uh, although they mm, consider uh, bilateral uh, relationship with China very important regarding uh, China's uh, increasing economic power, uh, they believe that Iran has no option but to revise its foreign policy 
and to prioritize resolving its problems in the United States and, um, of course, uh, with uh, its regional neighbors. Uh, actually, um, they attribute the benefits of the agreement uh, to the de-escalation of disputes between Iran and the United States in one hand and between Iran and regional powers on the other hand. Uh, so, um, according to this mindset, the current 25-year agreement uh, can only play the role of a, um, just a bargaining chip in the JCPOA negotiations. And uh, its implementation uh, is unlikely in the near future. Um, I think uh, their suggested uh, foreign policy strategy can be defined as um, appeasement and uh, sort of a band beginning. And uh, we can see the representatives of uh, this viewpoint, this mindset uh, among the academics. Um, at the end, I should say that uh, it's too early to talk about the implications of the agreement uh, for regional and global order. Uh, but uh, I can say if it implements, uh, it would affect the Persian Gulf uh, subordinate system, uh, the Middle East regional order, uh, and the balance of uh, power in neighboring regions um, such as uh, South Asia. Um, not to mention the key role it can play in the US-China geopolitical competition, of course. Uh, from January 2016, uh, when for the first time the comprehensive strategic relationship uh, between Iran and China uh, has been proposed, uh, to March 2021, when the agreement was signed, uh, both Iran and China have experienced extensive changes in their foreign policy. Uh, in my opinion, uh, over time, the principalist viewpoint has dominated Iran's foreign policy discourse. And as I said before, the principalists are expected to win uh, the upcoming presidential election too. Uh, so um, given uh, the fact that the contracts to operationalize uh, the roadmap uh, should be signed and uh, should be implemented by the next administration, uh, I think it's uh, very important, very important to comprehend um, the principalist uh, viewpoint of uh, China and its role uh, in the Middle East and also in Iran's foreign policy. Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. That's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Zakia. It was fascinating to hear from you uh, the different aspects of the society of Iran, how different uh, sections take this deal differently. And uh, of course, it was very notable uh, what you have mentioned about uh, Dr. Ali, Larry Jani. You know, uh, it's on the American pattern where uh, an individual is deployed as an envoy on a particular issue. So on China-Iran deal, this individual has been deployed, uh, which will give the continuity uh, to this particular uh, cause, uh, you know, which has been uh, thought to be very important at the apex level. So I think we can see the continuum of it in the coming years, despite uh, regardless of which kind of government, uh, you know, comes into power after uh, Dr. Hassan Rouhani. Thank you so much. And now we move on to our uh, third panelist, Dr. Jin Liang Jiang. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we are really looking forward to you to uh, get more insight because in the media, a lot has come from Iran but very little has come from China. So we are really very eager to know about more about this deal and uh, why exactly was it timed during the foreign minister's visit to the whole region? You know, this is very, uh, people are quite intrigued to see this thing happening. And is there actually a geopolitical dimension to it? Uh, I mean, pitted against the US hegemony or so-called hegemony in the region. So uh, these are the questions I think uh, we are going to look for forward to some of the answers of this question. The floor is your, uh, Dr. Jin. Hey. Uh, thank you so much for your invitation. Am I available? Please uh, wait, uh, wait, I didn't check my voice. Am yes, I available? Uh, we, can, we can hear oh. you clearly. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for taking me as a part of this, uh, this kind of discussion. And uh, <laughs> And, and, and actually, I received the question list uh, given by you. 
And uh, uh, when preparing for this presentation, I tried to to put to to have a kind of a framework. And uh, uh, in that framework, I can address uh, all these questions. But I, actually, I, I'm not sure that whether I can really uh, touch uh, touch all these questions. But anyway, yeah, we have a Q and A uh, 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 Q and A part of the, this discussion, and uh, I would like to take questions after my presentation. Okay, and. Uh, uh, but by this presentation, I think I will come, try to come to uh, four parts. The first part is about uh, 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 the Iran in China's foreign policy. What is Iran's position in China's foreign policy? And secondly, uh, what kind of position China has in Iran's foreign policy? Thirdly, uh, I would like to address some of the points to answer a question. What are the differences uh, regarding China's policy within the new context? Uh, fourthly, I think I'm going to come to some of the implications of the, uh, the, 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 the agreements between China and Iran. Uh, okay, let, let me come to the points. The first one is, first part is the, uh, how China perceives Iran, or what is Iran's position in China's foreign policy, okay? Actually, I should say that uh, it is very clear, China, Iran's position in China's foreign policy is, is very clear. The first point is that China regards its diplomacy toward developing countries as a foundation in its overall foreign policy. And the Iran is a very critical part of the de developing world. Uh, if you read our uh, 19th Party Congress report uh, about the, our foreign policy, you can find that we, we talk about, first, we have three priorities. The first priority is our relations with the major powers or major countries, okay? Uh, major, by major powers, major countries, we mean first the United States, Russia, European Union, and India, and all these major, major countries, major, major. And the second priority is that our relations with the neighboring countries, for instance, Asian countries uh, and uh, uh, those countries in Central Asia. Thirdly, third priority is developing world. Uh, we regard developing world as a, as, a, as a part of our foundation in our foreign policy, okay? Uh, so the, in, in the developing world, I, I think Iran, uh, is, we would like to say, firstly, one of the major developing country. Secondly, Iran is also uh, uh, in our neighborhood, in our neighborhood. So Iran is very important in that sense, is, in, is very important to China's foreign policy, okay? okay? That is the first part I would like to say, how China look at uh, Iran. Secondly, China is one of the five partners that China has established comprehensive strategic partnership in the Middle East. Uh, actually, when we uh, interpret China's foreign policy in the Middle East, I think too much attention has been paid on China-Iran relations. But uh, I think we have our overall thinking about uh, our diplomacy toward the Middle East. Uh, to put it uh, in a simple way, <clears throat> we have actually five partners that have comprehensive strategic partners in the Middle East. The first one is you know, we, we have st comprehensive strategic partners with Egypt. Second, Algeria. The third, 
Saudi Arabia, the four United Arab Emirates, UAE, and then we have a comprehensive strategic partnership with Iran. So you can, yeah, you can read that. Altogether, we have five comprehensive strategic partnerships in the Middle East. And Iran is one of them, <clears throat> is, is one of them. Uh, uh, so we, our relations toward the Middle East is not just about Iran. It is our, uh, we, we, we also take care about uh, uh, an, uh, Arab countries. Altogether, I think with the four Arab countries, we have comprehensive strategic partnership. Okay, that is the second point I want to make. Thirdly, I think Iran is very important, is particularly important in China's Belt and the Road Initiative. Uh, when we talk about the Belt and Road, the Belt and the Road Initiative, we we actually we cannot miss Iran. We cannot miss Iran uh, since Iran is a is a both a very important part, part partner on the land. But also a marine, a marine time, okay? It is on the convergence. So I think Iran is very important in this regard in, in the Belt and the Road Initiative. Fourthly, I think China regards Iran also as a partner sharing similar history and aspirations. And we both are major civilizations. We used to have very pros prosperous uh, uh, history, uh, civilization, and we are both humiliated by the West in our uh, in the in the early years of the modern era. Okay, and but now nowadays we both have a very strong aspiration. We talk about the the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, and the Iran is talking also talking about. Uh, is a revival, okay? So we share, so in this, in this way, we share very similar thinkings, okay? We understand each other much better than others, okay? That is the, the four points I would like to deliver, that how China look at Iran and Iran, and what is Iran's position in China's foreign policy? When talking about Iran's position in China's foreign policy, I would always, compare Iran with Japan in the world. Uh, uh, Japan is a, uh, is a country with a population of 30 million, uh, 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 130 million. Uh, Iran, a population of 80 million, okay? But I think uh, judging by its political, economic and the cultural influence, Iran is very important, is even much more important than Japan, okay? So Iran is certainly very important uh, in China's foreign policy. Uh, second part of my presentation is about uh, uh, how Iran look at China uh, or China's position in, in Iran's foreign policy. So since we have uh, our colleagues from, uh, from Iran here, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm right or not, but uh, anyway, I just share with you my interpre inter uh, interpretation about the China's role in Iran's foreign policy. I think firstly, Iran regards China as a partner with ancient civilizations. Okay. Secondly, Iran regards China as a major economic partner. Iran thinks China is a, uh, China has a, a large market. Thirdly, I think Iran regards China as a kind of balance against the United States, politically and at a strategic level. Okay. Now, am I right? <laughs> right or not, I would like to have the, your free comments about that our, from our Iranian colleagues. Okay. Uh, I will, okay. Next, I will come to my third point. Uh, what are the differences in the different in a new context, uh, I think the first difference is that uh, though we talk about, I talk about 
China has three priorities in its foreign policy. The first one is major countries, now major powers. Second, our neighbor, neighbor, neighborhood powers, our neighboring countries. Thirdly, uh, developing countries. And I think nowadays we see that uh, the developing world is becoming more and more important in China's overall policy within the context of tensions between China and the United States. The developing world is becoming more and more important. Iran is part of the uh, developing world. Okay. Uh, and the second difference is that China does not pay that much regard to Americans concern in its cooperation with Iran as previous. I think China-Iran relations have always been within the legal framework. We observed various uh, the, 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 the UN Security Council resolutions, but China pays regard to US concern, which do not necessarily reasonable as China thinks stable and cooperative relations with the US is extremely important, not only for China, for the US, but also for the world. But though China still thinks that stable relations with the United States is still very, very, very important, China wants to pull the United States into the orbit of cooperation. Yet, China also is well aware it is very difficult. Yeah, so we do not that much to, uh, do not pay that much regard to American concern in this regard. The third difference is that the United States is delivering unreasonable policy, not only toward Iran, but also toward China. Uh, Trump's policy toward, uh, toward uh, China and Iran are not reasonable. But unfortunately, it seems that the Biden administration is not changing the framework, particularly regarding China issues. Uh, so I think, uh, 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 during Trump's administration, and maybe also in Biden's administration, we, we think that we are both victims of Americans' maximum pressure policy and bullying policy. Okay? Uh, bullying policy, uh, for, for, for China's case, it is about Xinjiang issue, Hong Kong issue, and various uh, the Huawei, uh, Huawei issue. For Iran, the Biden administration uh, launched a lot of conditions uh, to re revive the JCPOA. Okay, okay, that is uh, my, my second part. Uh, second part, am I right? Oh, uh, uh, the third part. Then let me come to the fourth point. What are the implications? The implications, the first one should be that I think the China Iran relations will strengthen. And uh, uh, since we we talk about the the, the agreement, the so-called twenty-five year uh, the agreement, but actually we do not have the the detailed content of the of, of the agreement. But anyway, I, I suppose the RMB payment channel will be it, it, it was addressed in that agreement. And with, uh, with uh, this problem addressed, I think uh, uh, China and the Iran economic cooperation will, uh, will see, uh, see a large increase. Okay? And uh, more big Chinese companies will go to Iran. Okay? That is the first point. The second point is that China's relations with Middle East countries will be much more balanced. By this point, I would like to say that actually China's relations with uh, Arab countries go the far ahead of Iran, of its relations with Iran. And we have, just as I mentioned, we have four comprehensive strategic partnerships with the Arab countries, but we, but Iran is the, the, the is, uh, we is that only established our comprehensive strategic partnership in 2016. Uh, and we have a lot of mechanism addressing the issues between China and the Arab countries. We have China 
uh, uh, arable cooperation form or something like that. And we also have a lot of uh, other mechanisms dealing with our relation with the Arab country, but we do not have that many mechanisms addressing China-Iran relations. I think in the future we have we we uh, China-Iran relations we are uh, we'll be uh, we we'll have more in interactions and more cooperations. Okay. Thirdly, I think its implications on uh, the, the the on on the global effort reviving JCPOA is very modest. Uh, very modest. Many people say that uh, uh, after signing the agreement, uh, Iran and Americans uh, uh, punishing measures against Iran will weaken. But I don't think that sanctions really work or any punishing measures really work on Iran. Uh, and for JCPOA, I think uh, uh, even European countries, Euro Euro European countries, Russia and China together are not satisfied with American policy. And the Iran is also very resistant to that, even, even during uh, Trump's administration, uh, within the context of uh, the maximum pressure, Iran, Iran is very clear about its uh, positions in the JCPOA. So I think that uh, the agreement has a very modest implication on the JCPOA. Okay, I will just uh, stop here. Uh, so yeah, I would like to que take questions after the after uh, the whole discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Uh, so the takeaway is, of course, what you said at the end, that very modest implication on JCPOA. I think that may raise several questions among the audience. And about the criteria that you have enlisted about the criteria of making relations as far as your Chinese policy is concerned. I was struck by one factor which you have mentioned that, you know, humiliation or maybe the pain by the West, pain by the US, that could also be a factor. So that also uh, throws some light on the nature of relationship that several countries can form with China. And uh, with these questions and uh, uh, your, your answer, thank you so much for that. Now we move on to our fourth panelist, Dr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Fatima, and uh, uh, what exactly we would like to uh, 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 hear from you is, of course, in continuation of what Dr. Jin has said, especially, uh, this is a question in everybody's mind, and as Dr. Jin said, that uh, China can afford to have equal friendship with all the countries. That happens only when everything is smooth and China doesn't have to take sides. But if somebody, or like you, United States is uh, inflicted or you know engaged in a war, then of course it has to take sides. So it cannot afford to have equal relationship. So uh, what exactly do you see the scenario where up until when uh, this scenario will change, uh, wherein uh, the US provides the security and China gets the economic benefit? Uh, is this scenario going to change uh, or will it uh, remain, the status quo will remain? So with these questions, I hope you'll touch upon some of these questions. Uh, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Ms. Fatima. Sorry, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, you'll have to unmute your mic. Okay, so you. you can't hear me now, right? Uh, I got the message that uh, there was something with the sound. Uh, I don't know if they, if the technical team can let me know. And it's okay. Okay, great. Thank you so very much for uh, having me on this uh, pan, you know, great event uh, with distinguished panelists. Um, I, uh, I, Dr. Garlic and Dr. Yazdanchenko said pre pretty much what I was going to say, but uh, I will try to add some, you know, a few more words. Um, I will briefly discuss the massive uh, new China-Iran economic partnership and the driving factors behind China's expanding presence in the Middle East. Uh, we'll also briefly discuss China's unique approach to securing its own interests in the region and China's extraordinary talent in maintaining relationship across the region as uh, previous speakers mentioned, even with countries that are hostile toward one another. Uh, finally, I will be pointing out some of the hype surrounding the Iran-China deal and the ways uh, it, it has 
been used, as Dr. Yazan Shinos mentioned, as a political tool uh, by both uh, China's friends and, and its toes, uh, foes. Uh, uh, your new news of the deal generated a fierce domestic discussion, as uh, said by uh, Dr. Yazan Shinos inside Iran. Uh, Proponents of the agreement maintain that Iran stands to benefit by becoming an, you know, integral part of China's multi-trillion dollar BRI. And that partnership could help Iran overcome U.S. sanctions. It could improve Iran's economy and enhance uh, its position in the Middle East. Um, opponents called the engagement in new treaty of Turkmen Chai, referring to the 19th century treaty uh, between Iran and Russian empire uh, in which some of Iran's territory was given up to Russia. They maintain that China has taken advantage of Iran's troubled situation and that Iran will pay a heavy price for any partnership with Beijing. They even warned that Iran could end up in a situation similar to agreement between China and Sri Lanka, in which uh, China ultimately took control of uh, uh, Hamban, Hamban Tota. <laughs> uh, in July 2020, uh, Iran, Iranian Foreign Minister Jawad Zarif announced uh, to the parliament that there is nothing secret about the perspective deal. However, uh, while the exercise of the deal is no secret, many of its details remain unknown. Chinese foreign minister spokesman uh, said, quote, on, on March 29, he said, the plan focuses on tapping the potentials and economic and cultural cooperation and charting a course for long-term cooperation. It neither, he continued, it neither includes any quantitative specific contracts and goals, nor targets any third party. So it's difficult to assess the, uh, the agreement's economic impact and uh, skeptics argue that suggests the uh, agreement may not be of high priori priority for, for China. Uh, uh, let me also briefly uh, go through Iran, uh, China and the Middle East. Uh, it's really remarkable that China's deepest economic interests are associated mostly with those uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries that are at odds with Iran, those that uh, consider Iran an enemy or a, a threat. Uh, China is deepening ties with traditionally American allies across MENA region. This includes, as Dr. Jean mentioned, uh, you know, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, UAE, and other GCCs, uh, GCC states, Egypt, Oman, Israel. China is cooperating with Israel, uh, Israel's high-tech uh, uh, industries, uh, establishing its presence at, uh, at um, um, uh, uh, you know, Haifa port, uh, Israeli Haifa port, conducting mili military drills uh, with, with Saudi Arabia and cooperating with the kingdom on nuclear program, uh, programs, I would call it. Uh, China's strategy for expanding its influence in the MENA region goes beyond Iran, as also mentioned, and is a broader strategy to expand its, uh, you know, the influence in the Middle Eastern and MENA region, uh, and uh, is focused, uh, you know, on less troubled countries. A recent China-UAE collaboration in uh, medical diagnostics uh, services and a joint uh, by uh, uh, Sinopharm and a joint vaccine development and production program uh, will have a production capacity of 200 million doses a year. I mean, uh, a lot of people expected that that, you know, agreement would be with Iran given the situation of uh, pan pandemic in, in, the, in the country. So this is just one recent example. In 2020, China became the GCC's top trading partner overall. More than 11% uh, 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 of uh, the GCC's trade, that's 180 billion, is with China and 25% of the bloc's total exports goes to China. Uh, some GCC countries are an active part of the BRI. 
So there is convergence between Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 project, as Dr. Garlic mentioned, and, and China's uh, BRI. In February 2019, uh, Crown Prince uh, uh, Ben Salman uh, signed a number of agreements and, and MOUs uh, in China, including a $10 billion uh, deal for petrochemical complex and a refinery. Uh, in that same year, uh, you know, the two nations signed economic cooperation agreements worth a total of 28 billion at a joint investment forum in Riyadh. Uh, by 2030, uh, uh, Kingdom uh, is planning to generate 50% of its energy from renewables. The planet's largest oil producer wants to diversify uh, its, uh, its, its economy and transform into green world, as they call it. In addition to planning uh, to plant 10 billion trees across the country and using renewable energies, the kingdom uh, wants to make uh, fossil fuels uh, uh, less polluting. Uh, China is the largest producer and exporter of solar panels, uh, wind turbines, batteries, and electrical vehicles in the world, and thus stands to be a kingdom's main partner uh, in this endeavor. Um, as also mentioned by previous speakers, I would like to uh, uh, talk briefly about China's really well-balanced uh, relations with rivals. Uh, as the U.S. attempts to disengage from the Middle East, China is moving in to fill the gap. The uh, GCC countries uh, um, uh, uh, still lean on the U.S., but they may be preparing themselves for a U.S. departure. Uh, China has so far balanced its relations uh, with, with regional rivals in order to protect its uh, economic interests. This means Beijing uh, has uh, uh, you know, has distanced itself from major conflicts in the region and rarely plays any role in easing geopolitical tension there. Uh, this balancing act has served China very well in securing its main objectives, uh, economic ties, trade, infrastructure investments, and finances. Um, so it remains to be seen whether China is going to be able to maintain this balancing act uh, if the uh, U.S. continues to disengage. Right now, it's free riding to some extent, using U.S. hegemony in 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 region in the region to uh, position itself as an alternative, but also exploiting the political order that the U.S. hegemony has created. Uh, what happens if the U.S. transition out of the, uh, the region and those rival countries start looking to China to take their, their, their side against the rivals? How long can China remain apolitical in the region uh, without a strong U.S. presence? I know I'm coming with more questions. Uh, as to uh, JCPOA, you know, China actively supported the 2015 Iran nuclear agreement, the JCPOA, and opposed uh, U.S. secondary sanctions on Iran. But uh, compared to the Euro European Union, its effort, China's effort to preserve the deal uh, were minimal. China's uh, tepid uh, support for JCPOA and its apparent uh, unwillingness to seriously risk U.S. sanctions could have an impact on the cooperation agreement. You know, can Iran really count on China fulfilling its, its end of the deal? Could it survive another Trump or Trump-like uh, US administration that reimposes some form of maximum pressure uh, on Iran? And let me also, I don't know how much time I have, but let me conclude by saying the, bringing more questions. The question is, what is so special about the 400 billion Iran-China deal? Is China willing to undermine its relationship with the United States and its other long-term allies in the MENA region and jeopardize billions of dollars of investments with Iran's rivals, uh, you know, for a closer uh, relationship with Iran? If the deal is real, and China is going to be Iran's perhaps largest economic partner, then 
this poses several challenges uh, for Beijing. Above all, it will need to maintain the balance in its relationship with other countries in the region, which could mean expanding its economic ties to those countries to match its newly expanded link with Iran. One option for China would be to mediate between its partners, you know, perhaps collaborating with the, with the United States in the Persian Gulf region and trying to ease tension between Iran and the kingdom. Uh, that is something that, uh, uh, you know, uh, easing tension is coming to news these days. Uh, so let's see if China could play a role or uh, if China has played a role. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Patiman. Uh, it was uh, very illuminating, and uh, I'm sure uh, we do have uh, a lot of questions raised by uh, your question as well as uh, whatever you have highlighted in your uh, presentation. So uh, we are now going to uh, uh, the question and answer round, and I already have many questions, you know, uh, on my table. So what I'll do, I'll just uh, read out uh, uh, the first one of them, and. Uh, this question is uh, from Mikhail Masoti, and it's uh, it reads that could Iran-China relationship in the long term uh, threat is a threat to the novel forces maritime domination. So I think everybody, I think many of us have this question in our mind. And how does this relationship affect uh, Israel's influence in the region? So uh, maybe uh, Dr. Jin can uh, uh, answer this question. Uh, Dr. Jin, if you would like to answer this question. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I, I think, could you put, put the question? Okay, I'll okay. read it one more time for you, Dr. Jin. So uh, yes. uh, we have an audience uh, who asks, could Iran-China relationship in the long term uh, pose a threat to the novel forces maritime domination? So, uh, you know, Iran-China relationship and the U.S. Mm -hmm. dominance. So, is there a correlation? In the region. Uh, yes, 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 yes. And, uh, <laughs> of course, uh, the question that has about Israel also, how does it impact Israel's influence? Because, of course, we are, when you're going mm -hmm. closer to Iran, this question actually comes to our mind. So, how does it uh, impact your relationship with Israel? Uh, so, okay. you, uh, please. Oh, okay, okay. Actually, we... If you read our press, com press, uh, press conference, uh, the, the summer report of, uh, uh, made by our uh, foreign, foreign ministry uh, spokesperson, you can find we would always say uh, China's rise, uh, China's rise, China's development is for its own people, for its own people to live a better life. Uh, uh, we do not aim to challenge anybody. Uh, we do not uh, aim to challenge the United States in the, in the Middle East. And uh, our policy is also very clear that uh, uh, if you read our, uh, the document, that we would always say that uh, the Middle East countries should, be the, uh, should decide and work out the framework in security and in other areas uh, on themselves. That is, that is, the Middle East country, they are very decisive on their own, on their own affairs. But external powers, external actors should not, should neither just stand by nor interfere into the, uh, into the regional affairs. Uh, external actors should mediate and push regional actors to, to cooperate with each other, to coordinate with each other, to talk, talk uh, with, with each other. So I think that, uh, that, 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 that our policy is, is, is very clear. We are not going to end. And the, the, another policy is that we would always talk about we are trying to find partners for cooperation. We, are, we would like to take everybody together to work together to develop, uh, to share development opportunities uh, to develop. But we are not going to 
uh, we are not going to uh, construct sphere of influence. We are not going to uh, to to seek uh, proxies in the Middle East. We do not have alliance policy in the Middle East. We are not taking sides. Okay, that is that is our policy. So I don't think that we aim to to challenge America in the, in the in in the Middle East. But we think that uh, the Middle East the countries should play their uh, should be. Uh, should uh, work actively in a, in a cooperative way, in a co a coordinated way to build, uh, to talk about regional, regional affairs, including security issues. Okay, I will just uh, stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jane. Uh, uh, and uh, there's also a follow-up question, uh, but before that, I would like to uh, go to uh, our panelist, Dr. Jeremy, because you know uh, he is uh, deeply into the theoretical construct of everything. And this follow-up question reads, uh, will the intense competition between US and China eventually push Israel to take sides? So, uh, you know, when these kind of questions come to our mind, uh, Dr. Jeremy, uh, what do you see? Because uh, we have heard about uh, pivot to Asia, you know, it was conceived not by China, it was conceived by the US. And then when the pivot shift is happening, US is not only withdrawing from conflicting region, but of course it is withdrawing from its friendly allies also. So uh, both ways. So uh, is, it, uh, uh, is it not, you know, the entire game plan, you know, conceived by US and China following that rather than, you know, the way we generally look at it as if China is, you know, winning the game or, uh, so could you please highlight and answer that uh, question? Like who is taking the lead here? Is it China or is it US? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jeremy. Thank you for the question. I, I would just uh, begin by saying I agree with what uh, Dr. Jin just said. I mean, I, I would just uh, agree with that, that China is not interested in taking sides. I mean, that's what I was trying to point out before that China is hedging. It's not just about Iran and Saudi Arabia. But China also has investments in Israel, they have investments in Turkey, they are trying to cultivate all the partners at the same time. So I, I don't think it's about uh, what China is trying to do is not, not to challenge the US or not to stir up tensions with the US. I think just the opposite, they are trying to maintain a position where they are as neutral as possible and where they are challenging the US as little as possible. Um, if, if, as you say, as the, if the US is gradually withdrawing from the region, then that does create more of a headache for China because then it, it looks as if China is expected to kind of take over as the fill the vacuum as the regional hegemon. But I think China will take a policy of trying to avoid that kind of role for as long as possible, or perhaps in, in, indefinitely. Um, it, it, as you were talking about Israel, I think Israel is a really interesting case because obviously Israel is heavily backed by the US. Um, but a, a, a China has also been cultivating Israel as a partner. So I, I, I don't see that uh, there would be any uh, tensions in the, in the, at least in the short to medium term. I mean, if the US does continue to withdraw, then that does push China forward into a more, um, a role where it has to be more proactive, which, which is going to require some careful thinking from the Chinese leadership about how they move forward with that but i think we're not in that situation quite yet and we'll have to wait and see in five to ten years or so but i, I would expect china to just keep continuing with the same uh type of approach that it's taken that, that i you know whether we talk call it balancing or strategic hedging or whatever we call it where it's trying to stay out of it's certainly not wanting to take sides and it's certainly not wanting to take over as the as the hegemon in the region. So I'll, I'll just stop there. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jeremy. Now, my next question uh, again uh, for Dr. Jin, and I think you'll have to start writing more, although you have been writing profusely. So uh, this is uh, uh, from uh, Warda al Kathiri, uh, the questioner. Uh, I'm interested, as you mentioned about civilizational issues that both China and Iran have grievances uh, and both envisioned for the world, uh, I mean, about the grievances. My question, does China ever consider Iran to represent Islam or Islamic aspirations? So, uh, or something else. So, 
actually the uh, the question is asking uh, what how do you view uh, iran's position as an islamic republic you know uh, baby i mean if you could answer that question it's a difficult one we we have actually we we usually think that the islamic world as a whole as the integrity as as, as the integrity when we talk about uh, uh, civilizations uh, we there is a little bit difference from our point of view between our point of views and the uh, point of views of uh, the huntington okay when Huntington talk about uh, civilization, he actually defined civilization as a kind of religion. So he talked, he only talked about the Christian civilization, Islamic civilization, and the Chinese civilization. The, 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 they're mainly talking about that the interactions among the three. But when we talk about civilization, we actually, we not only talk about, we talk about the cars, we talk about the ways of, uh, of life, uh, the, the advancement of technologies. We, talk, we also talk about the political culture, political, uh, political systems, okay? In, this, in that sense, we, we think that the Islamic world uh, as, a, as a integral part, as a whole, not we, we <laughs> We have no idea just uh, about, about uh, the, uh, the, the Shias and the Sunnis. Actually, I would like to say, only those people living in Gulf areas cares about the difference between Shias and Sunnis, okay? Those people in Singapore, people in, uh, people in, in Indonesia, people in Central Asia, in, 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 in the Caucasus, even in in North Africa, they they just have no they have no idea about the difference between Shias and and the Sunnis. Okay, so I think uh, that is uh, yeah. I have no idea about. The, I think when we talk about civilization, we we talk about the, the Islamic civil civilization as a whole. Okay, okay. I, I may just stop here. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much. But uh, it was beautifully answered. I would say you know you are more looking into. Persia rather than Islamic Republic of Iran. So, uh, because you're talking, of course, about Silk mm. Roots, ancient civilizations. So, mm. I think, uh, fair enough, very beautifully. And thank you so much. And my next question is from my colleague, uh, Dr. Amin mm. Lutfi. Uh, he asked, and uh, probably uh, Dr. Uh, Miss Fatima can answer this question. Will China be praying for the JCPOA to be reinstated to allow for easier trade with China? Or will they be hoping for it to fall through to give themselves an edge in negotiations with Iran as their only major trade partner? It's a tricky one, uh, Ms. Fatima. Okay, my microphone is on, right? You can yes, hear yes. me. Yes, yes. This is really a very difficult question. Uh, if you remember in my uh, uh, presentation, I, I mentioned that China was obviously a, a partner in that, uh, in reaching the agreement of 2015, uh, JCPOA. Uh, however, China did less than the U European Union in after, you know, uh, Trump administration imposed uh, maximum pressure campaign against Iran and imposed all those sanctions. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think the partnership between Iran and China is at a point of perhaps no return. So I can imagine that it would go on with JCPOA or without it. A JCPOA could really ease tension, could, uh, could make Iran more accountable to uh, its uh, different activities. And it's obviously for the interest, I mean, it's really good for the interest of the entire region. So uh, for a China with uh, long-term, say 30 years, 40 years already, plans in the in the region i think uh, a jcpoa would really contribute to the to the uh, uh, stabilization of the region and easing tension hopefully thank you so much ms um, fatim and now uh, one question which everybody these days are having in their mind and that question goes to our iranian uh, guest 
uh, what is happening at JCPOA and how is it linked uh, with uh, its relationship, uh, Iran's relationship with China? And uh, uh, what is exactly there in this store, you know? Why are a lot of things happening like uh, realignment, relationship, you know, uh, uh, all those things happening? Uh, what exactly is having there, uh, is happening there? Uh, and especially from the point of view of the domestic, uh, you know, uh, politics in Iran, uh, in which direction is the wind blowing? Are you going to see the JCPOA happening uh, or, or not? Or, you know, any breakthrough with the United States uh, or not? Or uh, what role do you uh, see uh, these major powers, especially China and Russia, uh, playing in that? Uh, is it friendly, not so friendly? So uh, if you could answer these questions, uh, because we have covered uh, China, but uh, equally important is Russia, uh, because as Dr. Jin uh, has said that, you know, if uh, uh, those who are not very close to West, I mean, they are close enough. So we see that uh, China, Russia, Iran, uh, but uh, we also know that uh, Russia and China also had voted for sanctions during the four round of sanctions 16, 2006 to 2010. So under these backdrop, uh, this question was reserved for you, uh, Dr. Sakya, if you could answer in an elaborate fashion. Thank you. Um, can you hear my voice? Yes. Um, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, it's a little hard to answer this question. Uh, I think uh, Rouhani administration is uh, determined uh, to revive JCPOA as its uh, fundamental and main heritage. Uh, so uh, the negotiations uh, are continuing in the hope for uh, the revival of the agreement. Uh, but uh, there are some um, complications, uh, there are some uh, obstacles. Uh, there are some uh, groups, uh, some uh, uh, very important and uh, influential groups uh, in the country, including uh, um, the conservatives, uh, who believe that the United States and the European countries are not going uh, are not uh, going to actually uh, remove the sanctions, and uh, Iran uh, will not uh, benefit uh, from the. Uh, Mm, removal of the sanctions uh, in practice. Uh, so, so, um, so uh, I think, uh, <coughs> um, or I predict that uh, we will uh, face the revival of the um, agreement uh, before the end of this administration. Uh, but uh, after the presidential election, uh, the new uh, the new administration uh, might decor uh, and uh, uh, they might uh, uh, might start a, a new set of negotiation with uh, Western countries. I think that uh, principle is uh, that uh, we are not going uh, to. Uh, uh, we are not going to solve our problems uh, with the Western countries. Uh, it uh, goes nowhere. They do not trust uh, uh, Western countries at all. And uh, they believe uh, they believe that deal, the new kind of relationship, um, Russia and China, uh, the only alternative remained for Iran. And uh, the next administration is going to uh, rely on uh, this block more than the Western uh, block. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, a part of it I missed. I don't know whether uh, network connection was at my site faulty or uh, so, uh, but anyhow, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zakia. And uh, uh, one uh, more question uh, related to that is uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, all these uh, countries uh, when they, uh, you know, actually have this uh, this uh, deal, JCPO, when it happens, then how exactly it will, uh, you know, uh, change the Iran and Gulf relationship, you know, uh, Iran's relationship uh, with with the Gulf, and uh, you know, uh, 
if uh, any any of the panelists could like to answer that question uh, iran and gulf relationship after the deal jcpa uh, i can just briefly uh, mention you. that uh, uh, it is obviously as i mentioned in the interest of the entire region well uh, the agreement was really put pushed iran's nuclear program some years back the jcpa and uh, it opened up iran for you know its uh, sanctions that were uh, uh, making life of uh, uh, ordinary uh, uh, iranians so harsh so you know so difficult um, i think in the long term uh, if you would uh, <sighs> If the JCPOA is retrieved uh, again, if you know back to life, hopefully, uh, they Iran should start, uh, you know, easing tension with the with the with its uh, Persian Gulf neighbors, and assure them that the uh, you know make some trust building basically to assure them to reassure them that you know this is no, there is no uh, uh, threat is going to be from the agreement that have uh, has been reached i mean uh, uh, with all these international agreements international agreements generally makes uh, governments and countries more accountable i mean isolating them is always has always backlash uh, you know, you have uh, examples, numerous examples in different parts of the world. So, I mean, for the Middle Eastern countries and for the, especially for the Persian Gulf region uh, states to, to feel more secure, it is, uh, you know, JCPOA would have been a, a major step and uh, hopefully steps that are going to be taken after the agreement with uh, you know, between Iran and its Arab neighbors. That is where I mentioned, you know, if China would mediate between the neighbors and, and would try to ease some tension. Uh, thank you so much. And yeah, please, uh, Dr. Chin. Thanks. <clears throat> Just a couple of words about this issue. But when we talk about the JCPOA, even Biden's administration and those people in Biden's administration who used to participate in the negotiation believe that the JCPOA is, uh, is a very good thing. Uh, or at least can we find another better way to prevent Iran uh, from having some actions of proliferation, okay? That is a, that is a question, the key question, <clears throat> the key problem. But I would like to say, the relations between Iran and the GCC countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, depends on whether the two countries will come to, together. And the, the whole, and all the GCC countries, all the Gulf countries come together to establish or construct a kind of a security framework, a security dialogue mechanism to talk about the issues. And uh, this kind of uh, framework or mechanism should not only address the concerns of uh, Saudi Arabia, but also concerns of Iran. And uh, only when you talk, when you talk, you, you, you exchange point of views, you exchange the concerns that they each other can feel much better. Otherwise, there is no way to, to, to address the concerns of any side. That is my, my answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, there's uh, perhaps the last question that I can take. Uh, it is uh, from Mr. Bilal. Uh, the Middle East is obviously in a chaotic situation where conflicts are the norm there in present days. Uh, can China endorse a romantic approach towards the region? Uh, in practice, would China challenge US sanctions that may block the strategic deal with Iran? And uh, I think, uh, of course, Dr. Jen is uh, quite appropriate to answer this question. I also have one light question in my mind, and uh, that is related to the nature of this comprehensive partnership that Iran and China have signed. Uh, it is what uh, Jawad Zarif has said, a roadmap. So it is a map, but when are you going to start traveling on that? 
map. So, Dr. Jain, perhaps this is the last question. Uh, I think that the, big, the first question is about uh, 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 sorry, what is the, the, the first question? Just uh, me, uh, can you just uh, yeah, uh, it uh, in in short, uh, the question is that uh, you have said that you have said that you will make friends in in the region, but mm. if uh, U.S. creates or uh, stumbling blocks opposition. Uh, then mm -hmm. how will you do that? Like for instance, uh, Iran and China is having this partnership. As I said, then when you actually start traveling on it and the US push the roadblock, what will you do? <laughs> so this is how it is. Uh, I think that uh, we, we, are, we are actually building channels to enhance our cooperation with, uh, with, with, with Iran. For, for, for instance, we talk about uh, uh, how to build the payment channel uh, of, of RMB, RMB. I think previously, since we have a, a very modest uh, trade paid by RMB, I think uh, China and Iran, we are, we are, we are trade, we are be paid via the RMB channel, okay? And that is, a, that is a very important. Uh, I think that you talked about the sanctions, okay? Sanctions, yes, China absolutely oppose sanctions, okay? We actually, not only China, but also all the people sanctioned by, by the United States are not happy with, uh, with, with sanctions. They, 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 they want to remove the sanctions. The sanctions are also the obstacle obstacle to the free trade, to build a world of free trade. Sanctions are also against the principle that the West has talked too much about the liberalism, okay? When you talk about liberalism, economically, how can you put so much sanctions there? But the sanctions are actually creating problems between the United States and many other countries. When you, it is much easier to, 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 to put the, the sanctions, but it's very difficult. You find that it, how to remove the, the sanctions. That is the case that the United States is facing today. I think with the China's development, I think China will, will be much, much more confident in having uh, relations. We are, we, are, we are much more, we are more and more confident in overcoming the sanctions. Okay, I mean, just, just stop here. So thank you so much. I mean, this is very uh, illuminating. I think this is central to the whole discourse. Everybody is having this in their mind. So maybe uh, a related, uh, you know, a related request I would pose to other three panelists to have some uh, their final words. Uh, and this is same same question. Uh, uh, how exactly do you see it proceeding? Like, uh, uh, can China? challenge the US, the alternative economic mechanism that Dr. Jin, most important thing is the lifeline, the blood of, uh, uh, you know, of, of this trade that is about to happen. Uh, uh, what in your view is the possibility of that happening? So if I can start with probably uh, Dr. Jeremy, uh, mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how likely can you see this happening? Um, I, I think Dr. Zaki, I wanted to say something. So. Uh... Uh, maybe you can. It's okay. You can conclude in one okay. minute. Then we can go to Zakia okay. with the same okay. question and to Miss Fatima the same question. One minute each. Okay. Well, the as, as a question of the the situation and the JCPOA and, and so on, I I and Iran's role in the region, I personally don't see any big shifts. I mean, Iran has policy has continued in the same way for for years. I mean, we were hoping uh, under Obama that the JCPOA would make a big difference and then everything went back obviously under Trump and now they're trying to revive it again. But I, I personally think that, um, you know, the, the question of whether Iran can be like a, a sort of peacemaker in the region, I, I can't see that at all. And China's role, well, China has to tread very carefully, as I've said, and China needs to think about its role in the region. But I, I, I think China will try to avoid being seen as any kind of hegemon, as Dr. Jin has, has, has repeated, right? So 
that would be my my final words on this. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zakia. Any last word on this? Uh, please unmute your mic. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I only have one point. Uh, I like to add uh, about uh, the fate, the fate of the JCPOA and the um, uh, regional order. Uh, uh, I think that Iranian uh, see the JCPOA um, as a, a kind of a containment strategy. Uh, although they uh, need the removal of the sanctions, but uh, they believe it's a containment strategy. And um, I think um, Iranian would certainly uh, separate uh, the deal with the Western countries, uh, with the all their um, activities uh, in the region, uh, including uh, their uh, political influence in the region uh, and their military might, which uh, um, the JCC uh, countries and uh, some other uh, Arab countries of the region are um, worried about. Uh, so, so I just want to say that uh, I'm not uh, optimistic about uh, the future effects of the J the future positive effects of the JCPOA on the um, security architecture uh, of the region necessarily. I think we should uh, look at them separately. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Fatima, are your last word on this? Uh, yeah, you know, the previous uh, you know, colleagues said everything they uh, that needed. Is it, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear okay, you. Okay, great. I mean, whatever uh, they are doing, they have to do it before the uh, presidential election in Iran. That's, you know, it's going to be soon. In two, it's, I think it's in July or June. And uh, if they, as a first step, just yesterday or day before yesterday, some additional sanctions that were imposed upon Iran, that were, this set of sanctions were, in addition to the, uh, you know, related to the nuclear program. The, these sanctions are going to be uh, taken away. And I think that would be a, a, a significant step. Uh, I don't expect any miracle in just such a short time, but, uh, you know, uh, the dragging the issue for so long is going to be, is not going to be helpful to anybody. So I uh, think, uh, all these parties are really uh, eager to reach some agreement to do something, uh, hopefully uh, uh, some effective uh, steps, but it has to be quickly, <laughs> you know. Uh, so uh, especially with, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, this uh, political uh, rift within Iran and uh, those who blame the JCPOA for all this misery, uh, misery and arguing that, you know, United States didn't keep the promises uh, of the agreement that was international, basically. It wasn't just with the US. So there is some pessimism inside the country that it could do, uh, you know, uh, uh, it could resolve, it could be resolved so quickly, but I hope the parties would just really move a little bit faster. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Fatima. I mean, you're ending that on a sound note and uh, with the caution of urgency. So uh, let us see uh, what happens. And any last, last word from Dr. Jin, and then we can wrap it up. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the, the last opportunity, okay? And a uh, well, lot of questions uh, mentioned about whether China will challenge the United States. But I would like to say that China uh, is not in the position to challenge the United States. We do not uh, challenge the United States as a nation, as a, as a country. But I think we do oppose the policy of the United States. We actually, we welcome Americans' leadership, for instance, in climate change policy, okay? We welcome Americans to take leadership, okay? In, ma in many ways. But uh, I think the world, because of Americans' hegemony, there are too much, there are too, man too many bullying policies. We need fairness, we need justice. 
So just as our leaders said several days ago, the world need the most is the principle of justice, not not principle of hegemony. Okay. So I think that that, that is we are not challenging anybody, but I think that we 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 think we need justice and fairness. In in Iran's JCPOA case, it is also that case. The United States negotiated the JCPOA, but finally withdrew from the from from the, the JCPOA. Okay, so and and laid a lot of conditions to to uh, to to revival the JCPOA. So it is it is I think it is fundamentally an issue of justice, fairness. Okay, so I will just stop here. Thank you for taking me. No, no problem. I mean, that's very uh, fair point, aptly put, wonderfully placed. And thank you so much for all these, uh, you know, views of yours. And with that, we are certainly coming to the end of our our webinar. And uh, I think the audience would agree with us that uh, you know it was a wonderful panel, wonderful thought, and we did uh, attempt to answer many of the questions that uh, our audience asked. And uh, with that, all that remains is uh, for me to thank the participants, the panelists, the audience who are there, uh, my whole uh, event team uh, of MEI. Uh, led by uh, Sharon, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Clemens Che, who has uh, put all these things together. And uh, before we part, uh, I would like to request all of you to stay back uh, for, for maybe a few seconds for a group photo. Uh, again, uh, let me end by uh, thanking all of you. Hope we can uh, meet sometime in future physically when things get uh, much better. And thank you so much, uh, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you, Amy.